Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land in which we live and work and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge all people of diversity in its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. We're very lucky today we're being joined by WA Green Senator Jordan Steele-John, who's going to give us a very quick wrap of the recent changes to the National Disability Insurance Scheme after the recent NDIS Amendment Bill passed through Parliament, despite the concerns of many advocates, families and disability champions such as himself. Jordan joins us from WA now. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank you and lovely to be back uh, with you again. We'll start with what actually happened when the NDIS mm. Amendment Bill was finally passed. Now, you said at the time that Labor had done a deal to ram it through, and I know that it also had the support of some independents. So just give us the um, one-minute run on how that went down. Well, unfortunately, Labor did, in fact, uh, do a deal with primarily the Liberal Party to pass uh, the legislation. The final numbers, though, in the Senate were very interesting because uh, not only did the Greens vote against the final bill, um, and I can take you to some of the, the amendments that we proposed a little bit later on. But uh, we also managed to persuade a key independence to join us in opposing uh, the legislation in line with the demand of the disability community to do so. Um, so uh, independent senators uh, Fatima Payman and, and Tammy Terrell also joined us in that uh, vote, as did uh, Senator Lydia Thorpe. Um, and very surprisingly, two Liberal senators also abstained, uh, therefore effectively uh, withholding their support for the bill. Uh, and those senators were Senator Linda Reynolds and Senator Maria Kovacic, who had both been um, very uh, engaged members of the Senate inquiries uh, into this piece of legislation. So at the end of the day, you actually had uh, a bill being pushed through Parliament uh, that was so egregious that the former NDIS minister um, couldn't vote for it, and the uh, senior ranking member of the Coalition on the Community Affairs Committee uh, couldn't put their name to it either. Um, and I think that speaks to the uh, effectiveness of the disability community's uh, campaign to speak clearly to their representatives and say, no, look, this bill is dangerous. It will cause harm. It will create difficulty. So at the end of the day, we saw a bill that the Labour Party thought they'd be able to pass in, you know, six weeks at most. Um, and it would sail through the parliament. Bill Shorten would uh, take a bow and do a victory lap and ran out, announce his um, retirement, uh, turn into a, a real political battle. Um, and as a result of that political battle, um, there is pain in the disability community. There is frustration and deep anger and a sense of betrayal that Labor uh, failed to listen. There is also, though, a sense of um, shared solidarity um, among community that pushed back against this bill, understood clearly what it was doing. Um, and I think though people are feeling those that sense of betrayal, they're also... Uh, very much feeling connected and not at all alone in this experience and confident of our ability to um, continue to build a movement which at the election will deliver a parliament uh, that will return the rights that have been taken from us. One of the main bugbears of the amendment bill was in relation to debt collection. Now, yes. please tell me there's now some safeguards in there, some guardrails to prevent a return to the robo-debt style debt collection. I know we've had discussions around whether or not it's um, a debt incurred by the provider or whether or not it's a debt incurred by the person, how it's supposed to be paid back. Can you summarise for us, please, what survived the amendment process and what didn't and where participants now stand in relation to debt collection? Well, unfortunately, Suzanne, I, I wish I could uh, sit here and tell you that the Greens amendments to prevent robo-debt robo -debt style situations playing out again had been supported, but the government flatly refused to support our amendments. We, we took to them a, a series of very simple, sensible amendments that would have ensured that no participant was ever in a situation where they had a debt raised against them because of the actions of a dodgy provider. So we wanted to rule that out. We wanted to make sure that uh, if the 
agency was gathering data in such a way that led the agency to believe that there may be inappropriate spending occurring, that they inform the participant that they were considering um, and beginning to look at that activity. Um, and finally, we gave them a um, amendment which would have ensured um, that there was a right to review um, and to, to properly appeal against uh, any debt raised against an individual. Uh, all of those amendments were rejected by the government, which make no sense to me. Why would you pass a law that potentially gave your government or a future government the power to raise a debt against a participant for the actions of a fraudulent service provider? So that would be a situation where the participant in question had never received the service and support, nor had they uh, benefited in any other way, uh, nor uh, had they been an active participant in any way in the creation of the, the debt, and yet they can be put on the hook. I, I was stunned by their refusal to pass that basic piece, and it, it makes me, it, you're only really left with the conclusion that the government wants these types of options on the table. They want the ability um, to, to take these actions because otherwise they would have accepted uh, the, the uh, changes um, that we put forward. We did have one success, and that was uh, one of our proposals to um, expand the debt waiving ability was um, accepted by the government. The, the agency can now waive debts um, on the basis of uh, they can consider all things in the waiving of debts, uh, with the exception of the person's uh, financial status. Um, but I, I would I would just say that I, I would say this about that, and that is that when we talk about waiving a debt, like the debt's already been raised, right? Like you've already received the horrendous. Um, communication saying you've spent money inappropriately, we're raising a debt against you. It's already been accepted that there there is a debt, right? And then the government comes in with whatever processes it chooses and kind of decides to, to wave it away. Now, that's really not an appropriate response to a fundamentally flawed system to say, well, you know, you'll just have to accept that a debt may be falsely raised against you, but don't worry, we have the option to waive it. That's not okay. Now that that's the case, where do people turn if they do happen to receive a debt or have an issue with the provider expending money out of their budget? And just to be crystal clear, am I correct that this money isn't paid back out of the NDIS budget. The individual is expected to find it and pay the bill. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, no. It would be a debt raised against the individual for which the individual would have to pay. Right. So um, that has the impact. It could impact their credit score and all sorts of oh, things. Oh, and, and their ability to feed themselves and their, you know, it, yeah. it, it's it's a horrendous situation. Um, so in terms, of, uh, in terms of where do people go from here, um, my, my message to, to folks is, that the minute, the moment they receive any communication in relation to debt issues, um, they, 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 the best thing they can do is speak publicly about it as loudly as possible. There's often a fear and a sense of shame and maybe I've done something wrong that makes us kind of keep it to ourselves. Um, but in the situation we're in now where this legislation has passed, and so much power and right to appeal and right to procedural justice has been taken from the hands of disabled people and placed back within the hands of government. In that situation, these issues become deeply political. That is to say, the solution to these types of behaviors and these kind of processes is to raise them publicly as fast as possible to create that political pressure, not only for the individual instance to be dropped, but for the pattern to be rapidly revealed. Uh, because we can't let another uh, robo debt situation play out. Um, that is totally unacceptable. So at the moment, the best thing to do is, is to literally shout it from any and every rooftop that you possibly can as quickly as you can. 
Um, and we will, I think, then need to work together on, as I said, delivering a parliament after the election that will fix these issues and and return us to a place of um, of legislation that actually works for people. Okay. Today being the 3rd of October, it's the first day, the first tranche of changes from the NDIS yeah. amendment bill comes into effect. What's, what's, what are just the, the top three changes and when can people expect to see those impact their actual plans and debt collection risk and things like that? So I think there's a, a vital piece of context here. Um, the campaign 11, 12 years ago to establish the NDIS was effectively a campaign by disabled people, our families and allies to uh, establish a program which would effectively give disabled people and our families the right to and the ability to negotiate with our government for the services and supports that we need. Um, it, it was effectively a power sharing arrangement. Now, the government was in the stronger of the two positions in that power sharing arrangement, but because of the right to individualised support, the right to choice and control, the right to appeal, um, the participant and the family also had avenues if government uh, didn't listen and, and push back. The legislation's central goal was and is to remove that power. Um, to end that power sharing arrangement, that ability to negotiate, put it squarely back in the hands of, of the government. Under the uh, umbrella of, you know, it's costing too much money. Um, and while there is a drive to kind of return us to surplus, I also think there is a, there's a cultural element here. You know, politicians and senior bureaucrats do not actually, as a whole, like people. They're, they're not, they're, they, they, they haven't spent time with them for a while and they really don't like people with complex lives and complex needs that aren't simple, that don't simply fit into their narratives that they surround themselves with. And they are indignant at the idea that a, that a mum or a dad in a rural town or a person with a disability living in a city might be able to challenge the government agency they they run and win um and actually you know receive the funding and support they need so there was there was a piece of there was a bit of ego and and, and culture here as well that bill having passed my belief is that the work of us as a disability community in responding to this legislation shifts now from a space where we invested a massive amount of time in uh, consultation and co-design spaces and you know responding to surveys in the hope that we would be listened to. The government's answered that question, no, we're not gonna listen to you. We don't want the responsibility or the requirement to do that. So now we've got to go from engaging with those government structures to engaging with the political system purely. You know, it is a parliament that is made up of parties and MPs that will return the power sharing dynamic that will ultimately solve this problem. And the reason I say that is because what we've seen today is, and I think this is the most important thing that we've seen rolled out today, is the, the list of what will and will not be approved um, on the NDIS. Now, this list has been created as part of a process which, quite frankly, if I was to call it shambolic, I would be levelling a massive insult at all of the shambolic situations that have come before us. This has been an absolute joke. We, we you know, the draft version of, of this that was put out for consultation listed uh, things like uh, period products as things you couldn't uh, receive support for under the NDIS, and then that, the mind was changed on that in, in the course of a week. Um, the, the period for consultation was shorter for those with intellectual and cognitive disabilities than for the rest of the community, and the list that's been published has a massive holes in it. For instance, um, if you're an individual who requires um, a piece of assistive technology that is a powered piece of assistive technology and in the absence of it you 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 might not be able to live so a, a respirator or you know something that literally keeps you alive one of the things that you need 
it's a backup generator. Because if you, particularly if you live rurally or regionally, if your power fails, you you, you die because the machine you are kept alive with um, needs to be needs to be powered. That's on the no list. And when asked about it, the the minister has said, "Oh, well, that's something the states uh, should be funding." And in the interim period, if people are in imminent risk, they should let the agency know. Ridiculous. Um, the pathway they created for exceptions to this process um, is a joke. It's an absolute joke. In fact, it's an insult because what they've done is they've created a pathway where you can, if you want to, make a case that, you know, something on the no list, maybe you should have it. But if you're going to have it, you've got to say what you've currently got on the yes list um, that you're going to remove to be replaced with the thing that was on the no list. And even at the end of that process, they can still just say no, and there is no right to review. It's not a reviewable decision. So it isn't an authentic uh, exemptions and an alternatives pathway. Um, and that's why you're seeing so much frustration from the community because they're looking at these lists and going, what I need isn't on there. And of course it's not on there because everybody's disability is different. Um, it's the product of their environment and their uh, the desires of the environment they wish to be in and their impairment. So you can't factor in everybody's individual support needs in a list. That's why the NDIS established a principles-based approach in the first place. All of that being the case, there's a lot of upset, frustrated people. Um, I reviewed the new information from the NDIS last night. I'm a paralegal. Mm. I'm a paralegal and a compliance manager by trade and a journalist and researcher, and I'm still not much clearer ahead as to whether or not the things that are on my plan are included yeah. or not. Um, that being the case, I, I know we've got to cut it short very shortly. So just just give us the rundown on where people can go for help. If they feel they need personal support because people like me are housebound, they can't get yes. to things, they can't, you know, they can join video conferences and that's about it. So where yeah. do people go to, what's the primary place? Like, who do they call, John, if they want some support or they want to connect with their friends or the other disability communities online? What's the safest place for them to do that? Oh, that's a great question. And I, I want to acknowledge that, that there are, that there's so much uncertainty right now. Like there, there is a number, of, there's about five or six questions uh, that are key questions that people have about the, what this legislation means for them that are, I still don't have answers to because the government hasn't answered those questions. And that is not okay. You know, these are basic questions like what will the, what will foundational supports look like? How will I access them? What does it mean for people with psychosocial disabilities? When will they arrive? You know, like it, basic stuff. And, and we don't know. And the government hasn't answered. And that's not okay. And I can certainly tell you and anybody watching that we will be using our role in Parliament to get answers to those questions as quickly as possible. Um, and, and to that end, I've been saying to people, look, if you have questions about the bill, um, send them through to myself, um, but, but also um, uh, make sure that you are making public the fact that you still don't have this information so that there, there is a greater knowledge that it isn't just like, oh, it's sorted now because the legislation is passed. Um, in terms of community support, because this it, this really is part of it, Suzanne, like I, I, the reality is when we were talking about this legislation before it passed, about the difficulty and the harm that it might do to people, um, that wasn't just, you know, messaging that we'd worked up. That That's the reality of, of, of what this bill potentially looked like it would mean before it passed. And it actually, arguably, the version of the bill that passed and contained some additional elements that were even worse than what we thought they would be when we were considering it because they were kind of introduced at the last moment. So people are already experiencing massive cuts to their NDIS plans and losing supports. And I think the government's going to continue to try to do that and to make that worse. In response, one of the things that we have as disabled people is mutual aid and mutual support. And it shouldn't be a thing we're having to think about. It should not be a thing we're having to think about because the government should provide for our 
uh, supports and services. They are legally obligated to do so. We are taxpayers. This is ridiculous. Between now and when we can deliver a parliament that will restore those rights, um, mutual aid is valuable. And, and uh, what people have shared with me as useful, useful versions of that are joining their either their local uh, social media groups of NDIS participants or disabled people. So at least there is a sharing of information. National groups, um, NDIS grassroots discussion is one that often pops up on the top of my uh, feeds um, and also staying in touch with um, disability advocacy organizations and peak bodies um, that are authentically representing the disability community so that we can know what is going on. Um, but more than anything else, irritate your MP. That's my final line about this. Irritate your MP. You are a voter. You are a constituent. You asked them not to do this. They did it anyway, unless they're a Greens MP or a couple of the independents. It's passed. It doesn't mean you know, it doesn't mean you no longer have a right um, to speak to them about it, to let them know what is happening because you're feeling an anger and a frustration that is valid and they deserve to hear about it. So there you have it, folks, from George Steel John, WA Green Senator. We still have a voice. We just have to make it a little bit louder. Jordan, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is Suzanne Jones for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>